Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Okay. Are we live? Okay. <laughs> That was very unceremonious. <laughs> Hello. Uh, welcome to UALCCI, our stream for the under, uh, sorry, for the master's degree program in creative computing. And I'm Phoenix Perry. I'm the course leader for that degree. And I was going to tell you a little bit about the program, introduce myself, and then we were going to have an interesting conversation about play and space. So, I teach on this MA, um, MSc rather, it's an MSc, it's very sciencey, And it's a really cool experience for me as a creator and as an artist, because it lets me approach teaching as a practice, both, you know, teaching something educationally, but also experiencing the people in the program. And together we create a lot of stuff and it's really fun. I don't necessarily have the pedagogy of you know, holding the room in a way that doesn't allow for lots of collaboration and lots of input. And it's it's just a really fun experience. It ends up being more like a bunch of artists hanging out, making things together than it does anything really super formal. It's a super relaxed deal. We have a lot of structured classes. So if you're interested in learning a bunch of tech, this is absolutely the spot for you. We have, I teach also, I have an engineering degree. So we teach a lot of engineering stuff. So we do a bunch of that. Uh, there's some machine learning, which is super fun. Lots of creative coding. So if you really want to get good at coding, this is an amazing place to do that. But then we're going to work together to make some creative projects. And those can either be design interventions, creative art, or things that you want to see in the world. Like maybe you're an artist and you want to use machine learning in interesting ways or use games in ways that tell your story and express your creative vision. That's what I try and allow for on this MA. Um, sorry, MSC. I taught on an MA before this, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, lots of cool languages. We cover C++, JavaScript, C, C Sharp. We do stuff in Unity, P5JS, JavaScript, a lot of JavaScript. This, this time around, we made like um, playable environments for multiplayer experiences, which was really fun. And our final, our first final cohort is going to graduate at the end of this year. And I'm really excited to see all their art. So watch this space for pieces of what they make. So that's a little bit about the Institute. Tom, could you play our video that describes everything, gives you a taster of all the other professors and their interests? For me, the best thing about Creative Computing Institute is the sense of community that we're creating. This is one of the few places in the world where you can see things from an arts perspective and also a science and technology perspective at the same time. And that means that together everyone is talking about something they can't really talk about anywhere else. I studied at um, University of Arts London. I was like the techie person in like traditional design environments where maybe some of the things I needed or the spaces, the conversations I wanted to have did not exist. So when I knew that the CCI was being created, I was always trying to find ways and how I can get involved. This is the first cohort of students in the program. I've been really impressed at how much they've taken the materials we've given them and, and made them their own. Every time I come in the building, the students are just like chomping at the bit to show their work to people. I think it'll be a very, very good career for them. So I'm showing my first project on the diploma. I thought it would be interesting to explore what if we could see in sound rather than light. So I did the week-long machine learning course and the p5.js course with the CCI and it's really helped me sort of develop my practice and teach me more of the development side of coding. It's really changed my mind about like what computation is, what it means to the world, what it means like to society at large. Like in the course of a year I've like really changed how I'm thinking about it. We have a beautiful mission and a great social agenda and we really want to positively impact the way tech works in society. I think of computing as a craft exercise, like pottery or weaving. It's going to take you a long time to become a master of it, but the first steps should be approachable by anyone. And I think that's an important part of what we do here at CCI. 
Cool. So that's a little bit about what we do and who we are and the approach we have that is a marriage between science and technology, creative practice and design. And if you're interested in exploring those things, this is definitely a program you should check out. And I would be interested in getting to know you and working with you. So if you have any questions, you can always uh, put them in the comments that I think are either on this side or that side of the screen, this side. Who knows? Um, and we will uh, read them at the end. But now, if it's okay, I'd like to introduce you uh, to a bit about myself. So I'm going to just pop open a slide deck here and show you a bit of this. So I am Phoenix Perry. For those of you who don't know me, I have a nonprofit called Code Liberation Foundation, where I teach people to program video games and make creative art using computation. I also have a project called Bot Party, which is my PhD research that I'm doing with, with Mick Grierson that you saw at the very start of the video we just watched. And it's a project in exploring how human touch between people can be explored in play and in environments. It was originally inspired by a modular synthesizer and step sequencer I made. And this is called BabyBot. She has a synthesizer here, and this is control voltage connecting to a step sequencer. And I wanted to explore ways that cases could be more welcoming and soft and anthropomorphic and emotional. And that really sparked a lot of my research. So this is the game. Uh, you hold hands in groups and the game reacts to contact between people. I took this project to tons of games festivals. I let about 3000 people personally touch me in one year, which was an experience I recommend for everyone. It changed my life. So what this project really does is it delights people because they don't expect to interact with each other in this way in a digital environment. It looks like this. It's these little boxes and they detect touch between people and also motion. There's been several iterations of the project. As an artist, it's been really interesting to iterate in the public, and I'm very interested in public engagement and public interaction. This project got nominated for a GDC Alt Control Award, which is GDC awards are some of the highest awards you can get in gaming. It was an honor for me to have that happen. And you can kind of see, you can also play it in huge giant circles of people. And there's structured levels now, and the game is a lot more complex when it, than when I originally made it. I have shown it at projects uh, in London, games conferences like REST, um, which look like this. And you can kind of get a sense of how people play it. So that is Bot Party. Now I'm going to show you a project I made with all the students on the master's degree program at CCI as part of a unit about spatial environments and public engagement. We did this at Welcome Collection here in London, and it was a collaborative effort. And it is a project which explores ecology, and it is a low poly video game. And I'll show you a video of it here in a second. But it was really wonderful to work with the master's degree students, because while this was a project that had been pre existing, uh, its involvement with those students, they really shifted me on like so many levels, and they helped me expand my thinking and I helped them expand theirs. And together, the the game really stopped being my game and became our game. And it was a, the first time I've ever collaborated with about 15 different people in a class in this way for a public installation. And we also worked with a sound artist named Ben Kelly. And you'll hear more about that in a minute, but I'll show you some beautiful stills of it. 
So that's me. You can find me on Twitter. Um, the video I'm going to show you now is for a future learn course that I've been making at CCI that you can all take if you're interested in coming to study with me to get a real sense of what I'm like in the classroom and the kinds of things I care about. Uh, Tom, could you go ahead and play that video now? I'm Phoenix Ferry. I am a installation artist and a game designer, and I'm one of the creators of this course. My research focus is human interaction, and I'm really interested in the way we interact with each other in spaces and fostering communication between people in public environments. My most recent project, Forest Daydream, is an interactive sound environment. It looks like a low poly video game. And when you walk into it, it looks like a low poly forest, except for it's been built in the real world. And their interaction points and games spread out across a quite large space. And you have to work with other people to activate the entire forest. The soundscape, which was designed by Ben Kelly, is all sound recordings done in endangered ecosystems. And the whole space kind of feels like a giant light and sound forest bath. And I'm encouraging people to think about disappearing ecosystems their role in that and how they can work together to help fix the situation we are finding ourselves in today. I'm really interested in play because it has a really subversive nature in society. It can kind of undo cultural norms and the way that we are expected to be in public space. Normally, you wouldn't pull back the curtain in the gallery and try and hide behind it or stack a bunch of curtains in a pile and jump off them to attack your friends. You just would not do these things. But because play has this kind of magic circle where we create a safe space for each other, people feel free to bend and question the rules of society. And I feel like play can really offer a way to reflect about our culture in a way that no other medium can. That's why I build physical environments. So in 2013, I got really motivated to create this organization called Code Liberation. And it happened because I had been working in the digital advertising world and I had done really well in my career and gotten myself to the position of creative director and associate creative director. And I looked around and there just were not a lot of women. And at that time, I was really integrating my art practice, which was heavily play and games based with my design practice, which was really focused on understanding brands and clients and strategy. And I just was really sad that there were not a lot of other women in a position of power, able to make that kind of work. And as someone who grew up kind of in Silicon Valley and making projects, my ability to code always really demarcated me from others because I also was able to speak to the technical team as well as the art team. And I really wanted to help other women be able to express their vision and express their creativity the way that I could. And the easiest way for me to do that was help teach a bunch of women to program video games for free. And I really wanted them to be able to express their stories and their narratives and the way they experience the world. And as we grew, we began to support non-binary and genderqueer people. And it's been a truly like life-changing experience. I never thought mentoring would do that to me, but it did. And I would recommend everyone consider how they can help empower other people around them. So the reason I made this course uh, was to help you get a kind of sense of what you needed to learn to make a game, wrap your head around some very basic programming fundamentals for how to code, and start creating your own games about your own experiences. Hey, so we're back. I saw there are a couple of, hold on one sec. Um, what has happened? Hey, can you hear me okay? All right, so there were a couple questions. So I, I saw before we keep going, I saw there are two questions I'll address. One was what part of the BSC was about creative thinking, um, philosophy, ethics, and what percentage was on the technical side. Um, 
it's about 50 50 really honestly um there's a lot of things that you're going to cover that are about ethics about how you use code in society about how it integrates into culture the history of computing the norms of computing and how you think about those uh, we talk about decolonizing um, creative coding and also decolonizing computing, what that looks like, what gender looks like, the history of gender. But at the same time, you're going to take machine learning classes. You're going to take Python. You're going to take C++. You're going to learn Swift. It is an extremely, I, I wrote it by in part by myself, uh, lar by in large part myself with a couple of added on classes uh, with our dean and our machine learning person. But it is a really deep degree. I'm if there's nothing else like it that I know of in the world. It is a special place where those two things are married in equal proportion. And you'll walk out of here skilled up and like able to go dev in Silicon Valley if that's what you want, or able to start a arts organization if that's what you want. Both those things would be viable career paths, or you can go work in advertising like I did. Those are all the paths that I think, and it, it's wild what you could do out of this degree. There's almost, if you want to go build technology for social change, you can do that. I hope that answers that question. Um, the other question is, uh, what do you see? Okay, I think I just answered that. And cool. All right. So now I'd like to introduce Danielle. Danielle, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your involvement at the CCI? My name is Danielle. I do the um, digital productions course. Uh, UCI. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm kind of like teaching the currently the basics of all this programs such as uh, Blender, Premiere Pro, how to make GIFs, um, how to edit images, um, anything to do with um, a broad array of um, technical skills that you need to learn. Um, I kind of teach a course allowing you to learn the basics of that. Cool. Do you also want to tell us a little bit about your creative practice and your work? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to put my presentation on. So hi, I'm Danielle Brathwaite Shirley, um, and I'm an artist, game designer, and animator and sound designer. Um, and how I got into uh, game design was actually really strange. Uh, it was through performance. Um, and so I used to create these um, performances that would be about wishing that I could record an archive of black trans lives. Um, and so this performance is around the idea of um, resurrecting black trans lives um, and how I would do that um, and wishing that we were able to bring these people back from history. Um, and these are examples of the installations of that. This is uh, my work, Digging for Black Trans Lives, uh, which is a 40 minute animation piece as well as uh, a performance. Um, but then I started arising, uh, coming up with problems because um, a lot of my work had false choices within them. And I really like false choices, but um, I wanted the pieces to react accordingly to the identities in the room. And I was trying to figure out a way to center black trans people um, when there's a group of non-black trans people in the room. Um, and so I decided to start uh, making like terms and conditions um, and slowly building up a small um, amount of uh, games. So originally all my game designs were video based um, because I didn't have the skills to create these games. So my first game I made was called Unarchived Adventures and it was a point and click video um, or point and click video style. Um, and so it would emulate as if you were gonna do a let's play of a point and click video game. Um, and I really enjoyed this, um, but again, they were all false choices and there was only one narrative to go down. And so I then made this piece, which is called Resurrection Pro League. Um, and this piece um, was built around the idea of wishing to, um, if you had this technology that would scan graves and resurrect people, um, and we would resurrect all the black trans people in history, um, but only the digital, um, mind was be resurrected and that became sentient and it was stored away and then when people started visiting these um, stored ancestors it started to become a tourist attraction and so this game and film is based around this archive that became a tourist trap um, and a destination of othering and looking at rather than appreciating 
And so there were two, this game came in two forms. One was a 40 minute animation that explained the story if I go back here, which is on the screen to the left. And as you would watch this, you would also play the archive where these trans ancestors were uh, stored. Um, and yeah, and so if you could just play the video, there's a short video clip of this. And so yeah, that was a short um, ex excerpt of the, of that video, um, and that was all great. But the it was kind of a walking simulator a little bit. Um, and so later on, I'll talk about my next project, which was a much bigger project. But how I approach my games, and I think this is really important, is that you don't have to approach your games in the way that um, you often expect. So it's not often about just having fun. It's not often about having good gameplay. It's, but it's about who your games are for and what are you trying to say with them. And so I always have terms or conditions for myself when I'm working. So my terms or conditions are to respect uh, Black trans bodies and center them, um, to record and archive Black trans people, um, to avoid trans tourism and not to recreate trauma. Um, and so within my games, I will have options that pop up like this, and there'll be a terms and conditions that you can accept or decline. Um, but the whole point is that if you decline these terms and conditions, then you are not welcome within my game space. You are not welcome to play through whatever we have created. Um, and that's important because I think it's playing is, 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 is a privilege. I think playing a game is sometimes a privilege and you get to put yourselves in the shoes and thoughts of other people as well as in situations you would never get yourself into and when someone um throughout my my experiences i try and archive black trans specific experiences i want you to be respecting those when you are playing through them i want you to be thinking about your own identity when you are looking at someone else's identity um and something really important for me is fiction and what I mean by that is, um, so within this game that we made called blacktransarchive.com, it's also known as, um, oh, I've forgotten the other name now, but so I'm a bit flustered, sorry about that. But <laughs> this game determines your identity. The first thing this game says is what do you identify as? And what you pick will change everything about your playthrough. Um, and we worked on this with 15 other black trans people and, uh, a trans charity called Trans Metro, uh, Transcend Metro. Um, and we we worked together to create all the characters, all the landscapes, and um, I made all the music and then weaved it into a non-fiction and a fiction narrative based on our own experiences. And so throughout this game, you'd have choices um, that would center black trans people, um, but also center the um, your identity that you chose. So if you chose white and cis, your decisions um, would be very different to those uh, who chose trans. And you would really be dissected within playing the game um, and questioned as well. And you could make mistakes. And if you made a mistake, then your chance to play was over. Um, I think I talked about that. Um, yeah, and I don't know, it's a really crucial project for all of us because one, it was the first time that we had made something together as a group of black trans people and made sure that there was absolutely no trauma in the game. There was absolutely no trauma for anyone in the game. 
And it's centered and made a complete fictional space based on our realities, using pictures of us to make the landscapes. Um, and, and denying this idea that you are going to come and feast of a particular kind of narrative. And so this is it in action. Um, it kind of installed at the Science Gallery. Um, but it's also an online piece and it was important. And I think this is um, a thing that I think about a lot is accessibility. And I often think about those who don't come to these spaces to play and those who cannot play. Um, and so this game was also online. It's online now at blacktransarchive.com and anyone can play it for free. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, just how I use gaming, gaming language as a format to um, record an archive. So my newest projects are based on game covers and trying to reimagine game covers to reflect what I really want to see. Um, and I think it's really good to think about subversion and how you can subvert these kind of um, aesthetics for your own gain and to reflect a community that is not often talked about. And that is my presentation. Hey, awesome. So let's go ahead now. And I thought what would be really interesting is for Danielle and I to have a conversation. Um, she's on this side of me. It's interesting. Uh, the internet. Um, hi. About oh. our work together. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could high five in the middle. How would that work? Boop. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All <laughs> right. It's not. It's not. <laughs> really silly. Uh, so I thought we could talk a little bit because it strikes me that you use a lot of open source tools like Blender and all mm -hmm. my tools, mostly like Arduino and processing and open frameworks, they're all open source. So I thought we could talk a little bit about the importance of how open source has played into our practice. Mm. Yeah, um, I think open source, yeah, I, I, everything I use is also open source. So like GIMP and uh, as you said, Blender, but also I use something called PhotoAnim and all these other things. Um, and to me, it was really important because I had to teach myself this, like no one taught me how to do this. Um, and so I couldn't go and spend 200 pounds on a, on a particular program because I wouldn't know how to use it. Um, but these free programs allow you to figure out and try to figure out how to get something that you want done. Um, and also they have so many resources online to find and teach yourself. Um, and yeah, because usually it's such a barrier because usually you think about like, okay, if I want to edit this film, I'm going to have to sub subscribe to Premiere Pro, I'm going to have to buy all this thing, and then I'm going to have to make a real investment plus with my time and money and make sure it pays off in the end. And not everyone can do that, um, which is why it's so important that these open sources exist, because otherwise I don't know what I would be doing now. Yeah, I, I agree. I volunteer and serve on the advisory board of the Processing Foundation, and I've made a lot of open frameworks materials and P5 materials with my nonprofit code liberation so people can have access to learning resources for exactly that reason. And free access to tools is incredibly important and in making open source tools, which is something I do as mm. well as I think a real contribution to creative practice into the space because it allows you to think about ways that you can empower creators in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. I, I'm working on an open source project right now with Rebecca Feebrink that lets people use any gesture that they want as an affordance in a game environment. That way, all bodies mm -hmm. can be accommodated for because you can customize your interface to do what you want to do when you get it. It's not like somebody's mm -hmm. going to define how your interaction space is going to look. You get to define that. And I, I think that that's a very different approach. And as a tool creator, that's one of the things that I'm able to do that is really special and part of what drove me into creative practice originally because I started working as an artist using Rebecca's tools. And I thought to myself, mm. how do I make these accessible to people in video games? And we applied and got a, a Google grant and made a open source plugin for Unity that lets folks do mm. that. And I, I think writing software as well as using open source software really, it allows for a world where capitalism doesn't have such a tight grip, right? Mm, yeah. And it also allows for, people that otherwise wouldn't be in this field to have a way in. 
because often there's a particular kind of threshold you need to be in this field. Um, and often it's like an educational threshold um, and a way to do things. And the thing that opens all, open, um, I'm forgetting all my words, but um, okay. open I source tools. Do. I have words any day, so go on. <laughs> Um, open source tools allow you to do is really just broaden the accessibility of everything because now you can have anybody making anything they want and so rather than just being used for the actual original purpose mm -hmm. they'll be used for things that the creators didn't even think of and that's the best thing about them so so like I'm, I've seen so many workflows with Blender being used for like things that I didn't even know Blender could do and then you find out they couldn't do it but someone has made it happen because they wanted it to happen and it was free and they spent 40 hours making it happen and that's what like I love about these um, open open source programs because you could just do whatever you want and not not worry about someone coming to pick up a paycheck later on. Yeah, I, I love that too. I personally think that the most enjoyable thing about that is that you see people say exactly like what you said, like, hey, this program doesn't work for my community or my friends mm. or it's not really serving us. So I'm going to either make another one or mod this one to do it. And because it's exactly. all open, I can go in and hack some nonsense together and it will work. Mm -hmm. And it feels really liberating. And particularly Blender, we teach Python at CCI and your first year you're learning Blender, but also you're learning Python. So if you want to go make your own mm -hmm. plugins, you totally can. And that really shifts the landscape. And you can learn Cinema and all these other really advanced 3D programs, but you don't always have access to the core engine. And access to the core right. engine really just changes your creative palette. Like it puts you in the driver's seat. And I find that so empowering. Um, another thing I thought would be really interesting to talk about is false choice. I love the way yeah. that you take agency away from people. And I, I think that's really powerful. Do you want to tell us people a little bit about your terms and conditions? Because I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, well, I have a lot of like, so my terms and uh, conditions are, they're in everything I do, every single thing I do. So if I have an installation, there'll be a terms and conditions right outside the door saying, if you don't center black trans people, you're not welcome. Um, and it's strange because a lot of time people feel um, worried about that because they're saying, oh, I want, but I want everyone to come in. I want everyone to come in. I want everyone to enjoy this. But the point of having them there is that well, you can't reap the rewards of something by a community that you don't uphold and center and cannot see as a positive influence on the world. Like, how can we let you into a space and let you do that? And so, and a lot of my films, are, there are these choices, I always choose as a choice which maybe the audience wouldn't choose. And it's saying that like, and it plays with the subversion and the expectancy of, um, I don't think an audience is ever neutral I don't think an audience is ever all good. And I don't think an audience, even if they do choose a good option, um, will necessarily do that in the real world. And so we have these false choices to call, kind of call out and kind of make light of, you're thinking this and I know you're thinking this and we're all aware of this in the room and you need to feel uncomfortable right now because that is the point of you being here. Otherwise you're not learning anything and nothing is happening in your mind. You're just having a nice time and I don't want you to have a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually really important and it reminds me of some of the things that I've done where I have helped craft codes of conduct and put in policies of behavior mm. in communities that I've been part of because they've not felt safe. And I, I, I just, mm. I was like, whoa, I'm in a room, I'm in a community that's really hostile towards me and I, I don't want right. to be here. And one of the reasons I love P5 so much and Lauren McCarthy's work with the Processing Foundation was Lauren's just specific awareness of the importance of people who are not white or maybe not male mm -hmm. in her space. And she really helped build the P5 community to be this welcoming, inclusive environment in the open source world. And I, I found that really empowering. And it, it's a subtle thing. And I, I find it really powerful that setting the terms for engagement is something that you can do as an artist. And you can mm. control the benefits from your work because you have that right. And it it's something that I don't think enough people consider. Um, yeah, because so. um, I come from someone that loves like role-playing games. Um, <laughs> but what, what I never saw in role-playing games is... Um, 
when you take on so usually say like Skyrim you take on an identity and something happens to you because of that identity but I always want to say okay what's your real identity and what would happen to you because of that and let's reflect that Mm -hmm. um, in a world that may not center that identity that you have like this world centers a different kind of people what does that mean with your identity currently? And how, what do you need to do to be in this world? And can this world even hold you? Um, and I kind of love those play, like love that play, like really enjoy that play. And ma it makes people really consider actually, is this space for them? And are they bringing anything to this space? And if they're not, then they need to leave. Like, I ha and I have this- um, <laughs> have I this, love have that. This, <laughs> I have this new choice in this new game, which suddenly cracks through the game and it says, here's these pages to donate to. You cannot go forward until you to do donate to one of these pages. And then it keeps continues to check in that, that you've donated until you have. And if you haven't, then it just kicks you out. This is fantastic. And that's a great <laughs> way to get paid for your project by donation to a nonprofit you believe in. That, that's mm, fantastic. Exactly. I'm for this. I vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the other well, thing you oh yeah. go ahead go ahead no I had a question for you yeah 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 hit me up hit like, me up um yeah because we were talking about accessibility beforehand yeah totally. um, and I was just wondering what you were yeah like how do you approach accessibility when making your projects so for me the biggest thing is I really got upset the very so I grew up playing video games like Pac-Man was like my favorite game as a child I'm still a massive Pac-Man fan I just I don't deny it and for me games were like this really important thing that made me feel safe they made me feel comfortable and and then I ended up uh, in my early 20s I had a disability that sort of reared its head for the first time and Splinter Cell came out and I couldn't play it. And I had to sit in a room and watch someone else play it for me. And it was enraging. And I just looked at this Xbox controller and I was like, like, why is this piece of shite designed so badly? And mm -hmm. like, then I started like trying to send emails and I used to have to use like voice dictation and stuff. And back in the 90s, voice dictation was not good. So I'd be like, mm -hmm. dear, Jan, comma, Jan, Jan, <laughs> and it was so bad. And it was the only access I had to this whole digital world that I'd always been a native in before. And mm. it, it was really crushing. It was really, really devastating. I was like, okay, I am a 24 year old programmer and my life is over. Like I just mm. had this feeling like there's nothing for me. And so I got really into analog hardware because I could absolutely still modify circuits because what actually killed me was the rotation of my joints, but I could keep them in neutral position, which meant I could write with a pencil and hold a soldering iron. So I started hacking existing technology. So I started hacking video mixers and putting these giant knobs on them. So it was easy for me to move them and create digital video, well not digital, <laughs> analog video effects. Mm. And I actually made all this really beautiful work around glitch back in 1998, 99. That was things like me going into a PlayStation 2 and destroying it with a soldering iron and then plugging it in <laughs> and see what would happen on the other side. And there was just all this like altering of commercial technology to try and make it work for me. And mm. then I started thinking like, why is it if I want to make music, I have to use a stupid mouse and a keyboard. I just, I want to be able to like use my body. And that's when I met Rebecca mm -hmm. and she and I made it so I can make music with Maxim SP, totally just using gestures for my body with my friend, Margaret Chadell, who uh, we also, she had a cabo, which is a really smart cello bow. And we hooked those sensors up and my body up. And between my body and her cello bow, we were able to make tons of electronic music mm. with no computer interface at all, all through gesture and embodied design. And it didn't hurt me. Like I was like, I can make music mm. all day this way. I can throw my arms up into the sky. That's no problem. <laughs> um, and that, that for me, that, that level of a customization, because I'm, I'm not in a wheelchair. I don't need the kinds of accessibility that someone in a wheelchair needs. I need very different things. And just because like, mm. when we think about disability in society, it's like, are you in a wheelchair? Are you quadriplegic? Mm. Those are the only two disabilities that like games companies are capable of seeing. And mm. when the Xbox controller came out recently, the new accessible one, I had, I was yeah. filled just with just like so much happiness and also so much rage because I was like, how do, 
the, how did this take you 18 years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how did it take you 18 years to realize that there's an giant group of people <laughs> that you just did not care about? So it was, it was, they're like, we're pro accessibility. And I'm like, finally, like, <laughs> finally, like, oh, and yeah. whatever. <laughs> you're, you're pro good PR. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that's uh, for me like I make a lot of installations where you can play with your bodies or lay on the floor because I lay on the floor all the time uh everyone who works with me knows that I'll lay on the floor during meetings which like the first time it happens people are like what is she doing and I'm like I'm gonna lay on the floor and I don't feel very good I'm just gonna live here <laughs> um so for me my body moves through space in a different way and I think about that when I craft technologies mm. Oh, nice. Good answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that uh, it might be really, we have a little time left. And I was going to ask you a little bit about science fiction, because I think you and I both live in a world that wasn't built for us. Mm. And we're like trying to imagine a world where like the Blade Runner dystopia is not real. It is not what mm. we're going to create. And could you tell us a little bit about maybe the utopias or alternative societies you're interested in seeing in the world? Yeah, like, I don't actually believe in utopias, um, mm -hmm. but I believe in trying. I believe <laughs> in trying to make trying to make a place that centers something and fails. Um, and I think a really good way of doing that is through science fiction. And many people have done it before. Um, but the, the thing that's great about science fiction is that because you've written it, it's so unique when someone else reads it. Because they're like, what? Why, why does this door look like that? And you're like, well, actually, because I need to get through the door X, Y, Z. But they would have never thought like that. And yeah. that's what I think is so great about science fiction. And I also believe it's archiving because it archives a way that you think and fix a process in your mind. You're going to solve a problem that in a way that may seem completely ridiculous, but actually for you, it's very functional and very straightforward. Um, and that's why like when people read science fiction, they're so enamored by these worlds. Um, but the problem is like, it's who gets to create science fiction. And often it's uh, like a white, a white man in a room and he gets to create science fiction. Um, and he gets the 2 million pound funding to make a spaceship, another spaceship that colonizes the rest of space. But actually like, Science fiction has so much potential to archive a type of thought, a way of thinking and a time and a moment and how to get out of that moment when the resources aren't actually available in the world we live in. I think um, so. Yeah, I agree strongly. <laughs> and But, um, but I, I always think of um, this thing as like failing as well, because I always think of like, there's a, so for me, like I want a space that archives people like myself but because I don't have one, don't have a space and a way to archive them, I always think that I will try and make something knowing that it will fail and knowing that I will learn more from that experience. And so I have all these like science fiction worlds that are failing to archive these people. But there's always a group of people that are listening to those failures and understanding that, okay, we need to completely continuously change them. Um, and yeah, I just think science fiction is like a really powerful tool for that. Failure to archive is a really, I had a moment recently where I'm part of a secret lady hacker group and it's just women who kind of are a little <laughs> more like further along in their hacking journey. Um, and mm -hmm. they, they share kind of like, Hey, here's this thing I learned, you know, it's just a fun little private discord. And one of the things is I wanted to show some of their work to some of my students and I went and looked and like, we all have the world's worst websites. Literally, like, I can give out awards for like, you worked on the gloves in the NASA space suit, and your and your website is just non-existent. You know, and there was like a lot of that kind of thing going on. And I thought to myself about how busy people who are in marginalized spaces are, yes. and how they do not have time to archive themselves, and they do not have time to archive their practice. And that that just yeah. really hit me. Yeah, like, I actually had a conversation uh, with a collective of mine uh, this Sunday about that. And we talked about, we were talking about how to organize and how to try and figure out what we want to do and how to do it. But then we actually got into the conversation topic that we have no idea how to nurture ourselves while doing these jobs, because we don't get the nurturing 
that other people get in these jobs. And so yeah. our practice often is without care for our own self. And we're trying to figure out how do we care for each other and care for ourselves in a practice and in a world that doesn't really let you do that because you need to make money and you need to make the resources and the, um, the projects that you want to make. The lack of care, I've been really noticing it with the coronavirus and the lack of care that people have for each other. And mm. particularly like the, the malice of governments, mm. just the, the outright malice in, in like the face of capitalism. Like, oh, so many people are gonna die if we open stores, but we can't let anybody's business close. It's not like we're mm. sitting on billions of pounds. <laughs> yeah yeah oh my god <laughs> we can get into that but <laughs> that's a whole over the conversation yeah but that's why i think that's why that's why like i don't know that's why we're so into games because we can mm -hmm. like make people think about these things while they're actually doing it like you could make a development game about that where you do you give the money to someone to make their own career or do you keep it for your own building like you can make them go through those choices and be like actually that's a really messed up choice and you're like yes and you've been making it your whole life. Why have you been making this choice? The power of agency and to explore the ramifications and costs of your choices is something really mm. specific to play. And even if you're using games in art contexts, the way you and I are, mm. it can really undo people. I've had people scream at me before. Have you encountered no. this? Yeah, oh, I've geez. had people be really upset, be very confused. They've asked me like why they're not involved or why they don't feel comfortable. Because of, I feel like in art spaces, the aim of the art gallery is often either to make them feel very comfortable coming in mm -hmm. um, or to have something so controversial that they're like, oh my God, I can't believe it exists. But when they have something that that is making someone else feel comfortable and making them feel non-comfortable and then the regular art goers, they're like, why? why would you make this? And I feel like that's the point. <laughs> yeah, I had that happen with a psychologist with me recently. And mm. he was watching people, they were laying on the floor and they were playing with their feet with one of my prototypes, because you can do that. I make prototypes so mm. weird that you can literally choose any part of your body to play with. And <laughs> these kids were playing with, they took their socks off and were touching their feet together. And like, he could mm. not understand the rules of this game to save his life. <laughs> and he got so angry at me and I was like whoa you're the psychologist maybe think about yeah. that maybe yeah exactly why are you so angry like your psychologist <laughs> you will know why you're so angry you can just fix it not us <laughs> yeah why don't yeah. you go unpack that instead of asking me to do that emotional labor for you just a thought <laughs> exactly exactly awesome yeah. well we should probably this has been really fun and I feel like you and I could talk for hours over popcorn <laughs> and cupcakes <laughs> But we should probably look at the slide, at the messages and see. Um, oh, oh yeah. cool. Yeah. Does anyone have any more questions before we're going to wrap up for the day? Because I'm here supposedly to tell you about our crazy MSC program. But this is it. This is it. This is what's going on at CCI. These are the conversations that are happening that you can come be part of. And I'm really excited because Danielle's new to the Institute, but we're looking at bringing her into a wider array of classes. And I'm very excited about asking her to teach on the MSC, which will be really fun, hopefully. So <laughs> talk to us folks. Questions? Anyone have questions here that we can answer? So, oh, there is the delay, so I'm supposed to keep talking. Uh, this is like, keep talking, no one explodes. Have you ever played this game before? It's basically, no. <laughs> you have to keep talking, no one explodes. Because uh, <laughs> there's a lag on the video. But okay. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, been, it's been interesting. Like, I'm excited to see the way that coronavirus refigures CCI. Like, it's going to change the space. Mm. I'm, I'm super excited to see how work changes after coronavirus. Mm. Like, yeah. how's it going to reshape work now that we know we don't have to go into an office? Um, exactly. And that you know you can deliver a class from home, from anywhere. Totally, so totally. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, so um, are there any links to industry uh, or placement? So it depends. Um, low power state. Are you asking about the MSC or the BSC? If you're asking about the... BSC, there are total placement uh, ability 
situation. We have a year for that that you can take optionally um, and do placements. If you're on the MSC, you can get involved with research projects at the Institute. And also we have a person who is dedicated to finding uh, career pathways in the industry. So I work with people like Nexus Studios, and we also have tight connections to Google. So there'll be ways that that can turn into internships. And in some cases, I've seen that turn into jobs. And if you really love a studio, like say you love, you really love uh, like Kin and you want to go work there, all you have to do is let me know. And our business liaison person can reach out and say, hey, would you be interested in having an intern or having uh, a collaboration with our MSC program? And we can work to make that happen, um, which is something we're dedicated to doing at CCI. Let's see. You should be living in London Probably after, I think that there's going to be activities on campus in fall, but if you don't attend, I don't think they're going to penalize you. I think the best place for this information, because it's all so new and so wild, is the UAL website. But we are working to put some of these degrees online. I know next year there's going to be an online diploma, and I'm pushing to start a online MSc, and there's even talk of a potential online PhD option. And I think people are going to really start thinking about online education moving forward. So if not this year, next, but if you're coming this year, uh, definitely, if you can't get here right at the start of the year, there's obviously people are going to have affordances and we're going to consider that for everyone so please don't feel like you can't come if you're worried about you know being here in september october uh does anyone let's see do i have to have an art portfolio to be on the msc absolutely not uh, we had design people come in we had people who had never made work before who were interested in coming and learning about other things i've taken people before who were educators who uh, my best student my single best student from the last several years was a science teacher who was really interested in exploring how play and creative technology could be used in the classroom and he made all of these ridiculous amazing games about how to teach science in the classroom and i thought that that was a really magical use of technology he was constantly making puzzles and things for his students so don't feel like you have to have like a creative arts background or a design background he had an education background we're interested in people from a wide range of disciplines like i said to the person who uh has a background in medical science like what are you going to make that is super fascinating i want to see how you use this technology to like further your life. Um, let's see, any other questions before we call it for the day? Also, you can hit me up on Twitter. Like I'm super easy to find. I'm Phoenix Ferry all over the internet. It is, it is a problem. Uh, so uh, I'm easy to find. Um, if that is it, I just want to put a massive thank you to Danielle for thank having... You. Uh, time for us and coming and doing this uh, and we really appreciate having you at CCI so thank you for thank joining you. thank you so much for having me <laughs> virtual high fives <laughs> high five. oh, wrong side wrong side <laughs> <laughs> cool see you later see you bye bye all right everybody.